As we prepare for Easter, we're considering the relationship of Jesus and his people, Jesus and his church. And today we're going to consider Jesus our example. And we're going to be in the word, John chapter 13. John 13, we're going to read verses 1 to 17. Hear the word of the Lord. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, a person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean and you are clean, though not every one of you are clean. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that is why he said not every one of them was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and he returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and your teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you this example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth. No servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than he who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. This is the word of the Lord. We thank God for his word. I want us to consider three points from this passage, but before we get to those points, we need to deal with something that's a little bit foreign to us as 21st century North American readers of scripture. This cultural reality that's being expressed here, this uh, historical context, the need for foot washing, the practice of washing a guest's feet, that is something that is very far removed from our experience. How would you feel if you were invited out to dinner at a friend's house and as you enter the door they ask you to take your shoes off at the door and not only did you take your shoes off but they then told you that they were going to wash your feet before the meal. Most of us would be intensely uncomfortable. And yet this is what we see going on in the passage here. How do we understand this practice of foot washing and how does it help us understand God's message, God's truth for us in the passage itself. Well, let's begin by noticing in verse one that the whole of this text takes place in the shadow of Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday. This is an Easter passage. It says in verse 13, or verse one of chapter 13, it was just before the Passover feast and Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were with him in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. Whether your translation says the fullness of his love, the full extent of it, how big God's love for us is in Jesus, or whether it's talking about duration. Maybe it says he loved them to the end or to the uttermost. Either way, what we're talking about here when we come to the foot washing of Jesus, washing the disciples' feet, we're talking about God's love for us in Christ, the fullness of it. So this passage, this practice of foot washing, it is an expression of God's love for us in Jesus. Jesus loved them to the full extent 
that is possible for one person to love another. He showed them the extent of his love. If we then consider what exactly is foot washing, why is it taking place? What's the, what's the historical context? What's the significance of it? Let me read for you a couple of quotes that'll help us get to the root of that idea. It says in Manners and Customs of the Bible, where the soil is dry and dusty and sandals or similar footwear are worn, frequent washing of the feet is not only a luxury, but a necessity for comfort and health. It is also extremely refreshing, as anyone knows who has ever bathed their feet in cool water when they're dusty and hot. Under such circumstances, it is its great hospitality and consideration to see that the feet of guests are washed with cool water. Just as important as feeding them when they're hungry or giving them a place to rest when they're tired. Not to do so would be discourteous and even insulting. This is a matter of hospitality to wash the feet of your guests, just like feeding them, just like giving them a place to sleep. Colin Krauss in his introduction and commentary on the book of John says this, Jesus action was unprecedented. A wife might wash her husband's feet, children might wash their father's feet, and disciples might wash their master's feet. But in every case, it would be an act of extreme devotion Foot washing was normally carried out by a servant, not by those participating in the meal. And it was certainly not by the one presiding at the meal. According to later Jewish tradition, a Jewish slave would not be asked to wash people's feet. The task was assigned to a Gentile slave. Presumably, there was no servant at the venue where Jesus ate the Passover with his disciples. There must have been a period of embarrassment as the disciples realized there was no one available to do the foot washing and none of them was prepared to carry out this menial service for the others. The consternation of the disciples would have been palpable as they realized Jesus was preparing himself to carry out this lowly service. You see, the job was necessary. It was important, but it was demeaning. And their master, their teacher, their Lord took it up for himself. And he demonstrated to them the full extent of his love. Francis Schaeffer, as he talks about how the church picks up the themes of this passage and how we reenact as we're told to do, you should follow my example, Jesus is going to say, as we consider what that means for us. Francis, Francis Schaeffer, in his book, No Little People, says this, to the extent that we want power, we are in the flesh, and the Holy Spirit has no part in us. Christ put a towel around himself and washed his disciples' feet. We should ask ourselves from time to time, whose feet am I washing? Some churches have made foot washing into a third sacrament. That would be alongside the Lord's table and baptism. Members wash each other's feet during their worship services. While most of us think this is a mistake to make this a sacrament, let us admit that it is 10,000 times better to wash, wash each other's feet in a literal way than to never wash anybody's feet in any way. So as we consider this passage, let me give you three ideas, three things we probably should reflect on. And there are many more, of course. But first, let me begin with an aside. You'll notice that midway through the passage, Peter speaks up. The one commentator notices there must have been a sense of tension as Jesus went around the table doing this for his disciples, an act that was debasing and demeaning. And yet no one speaks up until it comes to Peter's turn. And Peter, of course, of course it was going to be Peter, speaks up and says, Jesus, you shouldn't be washing my feet. Jesus replies to him, well, unless I wash you, you have no part in me. Peter says, well, in that case, wash me all, wash all of me, my hands, my head, wash me, Jesus. If, if this is what it takes to become uh, part of what you're doing, if this is what it means to belong to you, then wash me. Jesus says to him, a person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. Remember, we said, it's going to point back to the fact that Judas is not one of 
those who have actually put their trust in Jesus. And Jesus knows this, and yet he does not deny him the act of love. So it tells us in verse 11 that he knew who was going to betray him. And that is why he said, not every one of you is clean. Jesus points to the fact that every so often, fellowship together, fellowship together in Jesus requires the occasional washing of our feet. And that's actually an aside. If we read the passage, we see that this is this is a by-the-way statement because what Jesus is doing is he's providing an example of what it means to love one another well. And he's going to command us and offer blessing to us if we follow his example. That's the main idea of this passage. But there is an opportunity Jesus has because of Peter's words and statement to demonstrate something by the way. And this is the by-the-way statement. Sometimes living together requires that we wash our dirty feet. As we gather together as the people of God, Jesus and his church, do we recognize that there is a proper place and in fact, an essential place for coming with repentance and hearts that are grieve, genuinely grieve the, the sin that ought to have no place in our lives. We walk the dusty roads of this world and our flesh pulls at us we hear over and over in scripture that tug that we need to cry out to God. God, give us the strength to fight, to stand and live well. And fellowship together means every so often we need to have our feet washed. We are clean, Jesus says. We belong to him. Salvation is ours by God's grace. But we also recognize there are things we still need to confess to one another and to our Lord. Remember, the Lord's Prayer says, Forgive us. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Forgive us our sins, those who have violated. Forgive us for our violations as we forgive those who have violated us. We need to wash our feet every so often. And if we fail to do that, it's going to impact our fellowship together in Jesus. When was the last time you spent time in confession when was the last time, having walked the dusty roads of this world, you came and asked Jesus, wash me, make me clean again. My feet are dirty. They need a good scrubbing. The second thing I'd like you to consider is that following Jesus' example will be frustrating and futile if we don't have the same confidence in who he is that he had in himself. The Father sent the Son to be our salvation and our hope. Did you hear what it said in John 13, 3? Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and he was returning to God. And in verse 4, it says, So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. What Jesus did came from his self-understanding, who he was, what he had been sent to do, and the fact that his father was giving him all things. He was being faithful to who he was and what the father had sent him to do. Jesus' actions are prompted by his self-understanding. And if we don't begin from that same point, if we don't begin our attempts to follow Jesus, our desire to follow his example, if we don't begin those things with who he is, we are going to be frustrated and we are going to feel an overwhelming sense of futility because we will be trying to accomplish for ourselves what Jesus has already won by his power and grace. Let me put it to you this way. Jesus is our hope and he is our only hope. When we understand what is ours in him, it reframes everything else. Because of who Jesus is and because of what he has done, there is an inheritance waiting for me in heaven, Peter tells me, that will never perish, spoil, or fade. All the riches of heaven are mine because of who Jesus is and because of what he has done. And they are waiting for me 
At just the right time, they'll be mine forever. Think about what Paul says in Romans chapter 8. Romans 8, 31 and 32. Listen to what Paul says. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Paul says when you know who God is, and when you realize what he has done for us in Jesus, it reframes our perspective on the world. If you go out and try and live the self-giving love that Jesus lived daily, but you do it without the strength that Jesus gives, if you go out and you try and give everything you have so that you can imitate Jesus, but you don't have the hope that comes knowing that you're secure in him, that you belong to him, that there's an inheritance waiting for you in him, it will destroy you and consume you because you can never do and earn for yourself what Jesus has already done and earned on your behalf. It is by grace you are saved, Paul says in Ephesians. It's not of works. It's not something you can earn. And absolutely, Jesus says, if you want to be my disciple, you need to take up your cross daily and follow me. But it is a following him. It is walking the path he has already walked perfectly, completely. The author and perfecter, the finisher of our salvation. We follow him, not forging a new path, not making a way for ourselves. We follow him recognizing his love has set us free and because of who Jesus was, because he came from the Father to save us and because he has returned to the Father to make a place for us, we now have freedom to give and give and give, remembering that God is going to graciously, with the Son, give us all things. And lastly, one of the great things about this passage of Scripture is Jesus himself says, this is what all of these things mean. This is what I've been doing. This is what I've been trying to demonstrate for you. This is the take-home for the lesson today, kids. Jesus says in verses 12 to 17, when he had finished washing their feet, he put his clothes on and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and your teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. This is the punchline. This is the point everything was tending towards. Jesus, who is our hope, Jesus, who is the one who has come to be crowned King of Kings and Lord of Lords, our teacher, our Lord, he has done this to set an example for us. And we are blessed as we follow that example. It's important to recognize that this is a theme that Jesus is really going to emphasize in the coming chapters. Remember, this whole passage takes place in the shadow of Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday. And just a little bit further down in the passage, in the midst of the section that deals with Peter's denial, Jesus says, A new command I give to you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Again, Jesus sets the pattern and he calls his disciples to follow in that pattern. Reading from verse chapter 15, Jesus again reiterates this idea of loving well, laying down your life for those you love. Jesus says in chapter 15, verses 9 
to 17. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Again, rooted in who Jesus is and what he's done. He continues, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then my father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. Love each other. There is a famous Hippocratic oath that doctors take. Do no harm. Jesus calls us to be and do more than just no harm. He calls us to love thoroughly, love completely, love to the uttermost. The example he set has become our pattern for living. It means taking off your garments, setting aside the rights you may have, what you are entitled to, setting them aside and washing the feet of those who are around you, loving well, laying down your life. We can do that with confidence because we know who Jesus is and we follow his example. Blessing comes as we imitate our master, as we follow his example. Blessing comes as we imitate our master. And these are the two implications I'd like to leave you with. First, do you know the master well enough to follow his lead? You're going to go into a million different situations this week that Jesus doesn't have, uh, we don't have a precedent in the gospel for those things. Jesus didn't enter into those situations. He didn't log on to the network. He didn't have to go to the corner store. He didn't have to engage in some of the recreational activities. All of these things, Jesus has set a pattern for us, yes, in the Gospels. The question is, because you don't have step-by-step -step instructions to live your life in the, the concrete realities of the day-to-day, -day, because the specific situations you have, because those specific concerns, those specific interactions weren't specified for you. Do you know Jesus well enough to know how he would behave, to know how his love would look in the here and now? Do you know him well enough to follow his lead? And I think this is one of the reasons why we need to recognize that the New Testament calls us repeatedly to live in the power of the Spirit. Because as we're going to hear in the passages leading up to the crucifixion, as we read between John 13 and the end of the book, Jesus is sending his Spirit to teach us, to show us his truth in the day-by-day -day things of this world. Make it your aim every single day to know him better, a little better, a little better, each day more of him at work in you. Do you know Jesus well enough to follow his lead? Are you walking in step with the Spirit, keeping in step with the Spirit, Paul says in Galatians, so that you can see the example of Jesus played out in your life today? The other implication I'd like to point out is that if you are not imitating Jesus, the question I would have for you is, to what teacher and Lord do you belong? To what teacher and Lord do you really belong if it is not Jesus' example you are imitating? God is calling us to live the next world's reality, live eternal truths here and now in this world. And it's going to be a real struggle, and we understand that. But if the day-by-day -day practice, the day-by-day -day habits of your life are not following Jesus' example, the most ready answer to the reason for that 
is there is some other master, some other teacher, some other Lord to whom you really belong. This is a diagnostic question. Who is your master? You will follow their example. Jesus is our hope, and we should follow him. There is tremendous blessing waiting for those who love Jesus. At the end of his book, John says, I wrote these things. Even there were so much more I could share. I wrote these things that you could understand who Jesus is, that you could believe in him, and that by putting your trust in him, you could have life. Paul says that if you confess Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And those who put their hope in him will never be put to shame. Let this diagnostic question have its work in your heart today. Who is your master? Whose example are you following? Today is a perfect opportunity for us to have our feet washed. And you know what? Maybe you didn't wash your hands. Maybe you didn't wash your head. Today's the day. Baptism by the God, grace of God. That washing that brings new life. It waits for you today. The invitation is open. Come. Blessing awaits as we follow our Lord.